Welcome to the Trauma Survivorhood Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Miley, an IFS-informed certified trauma recovery coach. This show features interviews from survivors all over the world as they share their impactful story of thriving in their post-traumatic growth. We explore resources, tools, and coping skills to support the trauma survivor community. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Trauma Survivorhood Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Miley. We have with us today, Joshua Cameron. And Joshua is an elite master healer who has helped people across five continents with conditions like PTSD, depression, arthritis, Lyme disease, and so much more. From his own emotionally and physically abusive childhood to being a veteran with PTSD, and now having harmonized his life and his relationships via deep healing, Joshua is committed to helping those who may feel like they've tried everything. They've done all the right things and they still haven't gotten the results. And those he is fortunate enough to work with, they almost always get life-changing results within days, helping to show the world that when you believe in magic, you can live a magical life. I love that. Um, thank you, Joshua, for joining us here today. Let's let's just jump right in. So tell us a little bit more about your journey. So you have gone full spectrum, all the way back to what I like to call full, full circle, right? Back into this emotional and physical healing space. How did you get here? Uh, well, you know, uh, part of that journey and, you know, the, the, the end quote of my bio there that you read, which I really appreciate you doing that, um, said, when you believe in magic, you live a magical life. That's actually from Tom Campbell. Mm -hmm. Tom Campbell is the founding scientist of the Monroe Institute. The Monroe Institute trained the CIA on how to do like out of body remote viewing. And while I'm no huge fan of the CIA, right, this is all based in physics and this is all based in science. And so for so long, you know, I'd been really caught in, you know, well, what I see is, is what's real. Mm -hmm. But what physics, you know, teaches us is that what's more real than real is what we don't see. Because everything comes from what we don't see, right? Our words stem from our thoughts. Well, can we, can we point to our thoughts, right? Our, our thoughts, real tangible things. It took me a long time for me to realize that. And in my own journey, right, as a you know, little kid growing up in a household that had a lot of alcoholism, a lot of, you know, you know, violent abuse and, you know, emotional abuse, it made me feel like, you know, I was, I was really dumb. Uh, anything that uh, what came from my own intuition, because I was dealing with people who were, you know, really dealing with their own trauma and their own issues and their own alcoholism. Whenever I would bring up something that, you know, was from an innocent little kid, well, that would trigger them. And I didn't realize that was triggering them. So in that trigger, what that made me feel like is like, oh my God, I must be stupid. I must be terrible. I must be cause causing all my problems. And what it did for me is it uh, created what I called like this, you know, catalog of evidence to suggest that anything that comes from within here, well, should it immediately be dismissed. And I should, I should give my power away to somebody else to tell me who I am, what's good for me. And it took me a long time for me to really be able to delve deep into, in, into my heart and follow my intuition. Um, but uh, ultimately that's really what led me to a huge love of philosophy and science was because, okay, well, if this, all that I see is really all that there is, well, how do I get into the nitty gritty of, of that, right? How do I really start breaking that down? And decades long process of doing that eventually led me to spirituality. I was like, oh, well, let's go ahead and show you a little bit more of what not what's not actually even there, right? Like Niels Bohr said, right? Contemporary of Einstein, right? Everything that we call real is made up of stuff that cannot be regarded as real. Right, because the, the quantum space is you know a you know a wave of light, and that wave of light collapses into a particle, and that particle then coalesces and creates my hat or my body or your house, right, or the pictures on the wall, and you know I, that sounds so foreign and so strange, and it took me a long time to realize that I was trapping myself in my in my logical left brain. And what my logical left brain was doing was playing this arithmetic of, does this make sense? If yes, right? So a conditional statement, if yes, then, okay, you know, where else can I take this? Can I exploit it for my own benefit? Can, you know, can this, you know, help myself, help others? Um, if no, 
in real time, I would fold my arms and transform myself into a toddler and be like, I don't want to eat those vegetables I've never tried. I want nothing to do with those thoughts that don't seem logical on their face. Yeah. Um, and then what I realized even later, though, was what that does to somebody is, and I, I got this idea from uh, Jordan Peterson. So he used this idea that the Luciferian intellect and it's like, well, that's a really strange way to put that. But, you know, he's a pretty, pretty brilliant guy. So let's see where this goes. Luciferian intellect. Well, what does that Luciferian intellect or that logic do? What well, traps us and keeps us from actually living life as something seems illogical. We won't even try it. Right. And life is actually about experience, right? Well, that's what science is about, is about observing, seeing what happens. If I poke this, well, what's the result? I don't know. I can think about it all day long, but I won't actually know until I do it, until I poke it. Um, and if life is about experience, then we truly understand the magic of life by living it, by having a lived life. If you take the word lived and you flip it around mm -hmm. as if somebody just, you know, folding their arms, well, it spells devil. Mm -hmm. And that's the Luciferian intellect is that it traps us, right? Traps us in the, in the matrix, right? Right in here, all the noise that corrupts the signal that corrodes, right? Anybody who deals with any sort of large data set understands you've got to quiet the noise to increase the signal. Mm -hmm. And with all the trauma that I had going on and all the buzz, well, I hid, I hid from the signal because I was taught the signal was scary. Right. And, um, and so that's a that's a bit of 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 my story there, and I don't want to you know keep going on too long, but um, yeah, I found that um, I found those to be very enlightening in my journey. Mm, yeah, it sounds like they were they made a big switch around in your mind. Yeah, and I I love that when I used to try to explain um, long long ago, I was uh, doing acupuncture, and I know it's a little bit more mainstream now, but you know, twenty years ago, it really wasn't. And uh, this whole idea of, you know, well, where's the chi? What do you mean on the meridians? And I go, okay, so you can't see my energy meridians. That's fine. Doesn't mean they're not there. Where's your happiness? Where's your sadness? Like point to that in your body, you know? Um, and so it's really hard to explain things sometimes, you know, to people. Um, yeah. But I love that. It sounds like it really kind of, you know, flipped things around for you. So in this journey, as you are experiencing all these different things from the physics and the quantum science and all the way through to the, you know, philosophy really and spirituality that got you there what was some of the hardest parts in this journey for you well you know uh coming from a background of having that childhood trauma i didn't realize it but i spent the you know the you know my the rest of my life from that point you know hiding from that scared little boy right from all the bugaboos that were there hiding in the closet hiding under the bed and hiding in the shadows um, and then at 19, I joined the army, you know, so that was 1999 and March of 2001, I got orders to go to my first war zone. And that, you know, date was September 19th, 2001, right. Cause what could happen in America in September of 2001. Right. And so that was a really strange time. So then, you know, going to war on the heels of September 11th, um, then compounded a lot of that same fear. Right. And even though people probably don't have the same experience that I have and my experience might be unique, the feelings I felt weren't mm -hmm. right. Being scared, feeling trapped, you know, completely un uncertain of what's going on, you know, feeling like my life just got completely, you know, tossed on his head. Mm -hmm. um, and then dealing with, you know, on when I came back, you know, less than a year later, I'm going to my second war zone. And, you know, when I came back from that one, you know, since I actually had a chance to kind of to, to kind of breathe, I realized that I, I was a different person mm -hmm. and I didn't, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. You know, it was almost like, you know, taking, you know, a, a, a color canvas and washing the color out of it mm -hmm. and turning it more grayscale. You know, I, I, you know, food didn't taste as good. You know, the level of excitement I could get to, if I could get to a 10, I could really only get to like a seven or an eight, right? Everything seemed subdued. Um, and it ended up, uh, you know, ruining a couple of marriages, uh, and, you know, it took me a long time again to start to understand that, you know, healing comes from within because what it put me on a path of is, oh, I don't like what I'm seeing. Let me, you know, galvanize some force against that. But since I'm still a little kid hiding within myself, well, then I'm trying to contribute, but I'm not growing. Because you can't grow when you hide, which means I was playing a martyr complex. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, look how great I am trying to help out, whether that was in politics, you know, um, 
and you know getting mad over over stupid things oh you don't agree with me how dare you right and just in the throes of politics but again what that did was i would bust my you know bust my back you know uh you know bust my butt in order to get things done sacrifice my time uh in order to help others but not to help myself and we can only come from a place of who we are and you know until we change ourselves well, we're not really going to be able to change much in the outer world at all right it's going to you know start building this house of cards that just collapses on its own because our foundation is not built on much at all yeah. and you know, and, and so once I hit my deep spiritual path is when I realized the truth of the idea of if you change yourself, will you change the world? Because now I can actually show up as happy. And if somebody yells at me something stupid about politics, well, then I can kind of just step out of the I step out of the way of that instead of getting engaged in that. And that's when they start thinking, oh, well, maybe there's something different about this guy because everyone else I yell politics stuff at ends up yelling back at me and then I just get mad at them. But this guy didn't do that. He didn't engage in that. There's something different about that. Let me go talk to this guy and see what's going on. And it may not quite be that logical, but I did find that people started to treat me differently because I could carry my own energy differently mm -hmm. and I could hold their energy differently as well. Yeah. Yeah. Listeners of this podcast will recognize those words uh, being a big belief of mine. You know, we can't magically fix the entire world. It's just impossible. But the more work you do on yourself, you are actually changing other people's lives little by little, whether you know it or not. You'll probably never know the full ripple effect of that. But the more work you're willing to do on yourself, the more joy you're able to ascertain, the more, you know, uh, uh, coping skills and resources and the less that you get triggered by other people, the more you're going to make an impact in the world just by being in a grocery store and not getting upset at someone who's, you know, cut you in line or whatever, you know you said in in your um in the in your longer bio to me coming back from those post 9 11 you did two tours back to back you kind of felt like a shadow of a person and i could see that because you were living really in this in this more hiding place is what i'm hearing you know you're you're kind of describing it like so you have come now to this brand new place you have found this um, healing modality. You have found this place where you can do that deep inner work. Um, how did you How did you land there to actually make that deep dive? And what does that modality look like for you? Where did you really find that healing? Uh, yeah, I mean, great questions. Well, you know, the idea of when the student is ready, the master will appear is as true as it comes. And we may not realize it, you know, and part of that, really happened because, you know, I have so much chaos, you know, going on around me. I was going through my, my, uh, you know, second divorce. Um, I, you know, the pandemic was rocking the world. Uh, and I was working in a pediatric hospital. I realized just how political the healthcare system was and, you know, all, all the walls that I had built up around me to protect myself, you know, where they fell over. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize at the time is that walls are indiscriminate. Mm -hmm. Right. I might put a wall up to say, hey, I want to be protected from uh, from being hurt. The problem is, is a wall doesn't know what's good for me and what's bad for me. So it's going to keep both out. So I'm actually trapping myself behind the wall rather than protecting myself behind the wall. Yeah. And so once once those fell over, well, then uh, I, I started examining, you know, rather than being in a panic, rather than just being in the chaos. Okay, well is there a reference point that I can point to to somebody who can help me through a chaotic time? Well, you know, yeah, there is. And so I tuned into uh, Jocko Willink and the Jocko Willink podcast, who's a, you know, former Navy SEAL commander and been on Joe Rogan a bunch. So I started listening to him and really loved what he had to say. I loved, you know, his discipline and, you know, discipline equals freedom. And then he interviewed Jordan Peterson and, you know, coming from lefty politics Jordan Peterson, what you know, wasn't somebody that I was supposed to feel safe with, right? He was a bad guy, you know, because he, well, real frankly, he 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 thought, you know, um, you know, dangerous ideas, so to speak, and which was ironic because as a lefty, I thought that I thought for myself, mm -hmm. but then I'd point and be like, well, you've got problematic views, I can't think problematic views. Well, anyway, listen to Jordan Peterson, he just said so much stuff that made too much sense, mm -hmm. right? It just. I, I couldn't find a flaw in anything he was saying. So then I started listening to him more and listened to him secularize Genesis. 
And based upon the idea that God is less a person in the clouds and is more an ultimate ideal of goodness. And here's a, a model of what we've seen people do and the steps that they've taken to become great. And this is how we've seen it from afar. And this is how we've we've told our our culture and our families and our, you know, just past, you know, throughout history. It's like, well, that's that's bloody brilliant. Right. And so if this is the wisdom of the Bible that he sees, well, is there room for that sort of philosophical, brilliant God in my life? And that question transformed my life. And within six months, I had my mentor just pop into my life. Never even heard of him in my life. His name is uh, Peter Sage. And he's, uh, you know, world renowned uh, in consciousness, maybe, uh, you know, even a world leader in, uh, in consciousness. Uh, he's worked with, you know, different world governments. And, you know, he took me a deep dive in consciousness and neuroscience and physics, um, nonlinear dynamics, you know, psychology, and really wrapped it together. And then I had this decades of philosophy and it just everything just started falling into place. Mm -hmm. And then within three months, of, uh, three months of meeting Peter is when I met who I thought was the most bizarre person I've ever met in my life. Who's this guy talking about how, uh, you know, he's, he's a healer. Uh, and that, you know, things I used to laugh at, you know, things that Jesus talked about, frankly, you know, demons and curses and dark, you know, dark forces. Uh, he's talking like, these are real things like, what, <laughs> what? Um, and I found that really strange because for so long, I was that guy that was like, does this make sense? Oh, it doesn't. Let me fold my arms in real time and transform myself into a toddler. But he was introduced to me by my mentor. And my mentor is exactly where I want to be. So I trust him implicitly. And so now I'm like, what do I do with this? And so the best thing I found I could do was suspend my need to decide what I believed mm -hmm. and just sus suspend the need to, to label and just, okay, well, let's take it as it is. Let's see where this goes. I'm skeptical, of course, because it's strange, but let's validate and see where this goes. And, you know, I followed him for a few weeks. And, you know, as I started doing his meditations that he was putting on, you know, through Facebook lives, then he gave me a free gift. I could literally feel the energy inside my body. Like I could literally feel it moving. Like, okay, there's, this guy's playing with a whole new rule book that I, you know, playbook that I've never even heard of. So there, there's something going on that I don't understand and starting to work with him was incredible, you know, within, you know, cause I first had to learn how to heal myself and then he taught us how to heal others. Uh, and once I healed myself and went through my own, you know, healing process, doing his meditations, which was, you know, only like three weeks within the first hour of him, like actually having the live training with us, he said, all right, who wants to heal somebody? Like I've been doing this for an hour. What do you, what do you mean? Who wants to heal somebody? Um, so, and this is all over zoom, all completely remote. Um, so he puts me in a breakout room with a lady who didn't even turn on her camera. So I can't see visually. If she's being compliant, okay, well, this is a little strange. I'm an hour into this, can't even you know see her face. Um, and then instead of somebody who's like, hey, I've got a hurt arm or I've got a hurt leg or I've got a headache, she gave me something very nebulous, like I have libido issues. Like, okay, can this get any more complicated, right? And say, like, okay, well, all right. I already said I was, I was up for the challenge, so let's try it. So I took her through a seven-minute uh, micro meditation. And within those seven minutes, she told me afterwards that she literally felt something flicking her ovaries as if they, they get the, the energy back moving through her system. again. I was like, what? And so in his brilliance, he knew that the best way to convince somebody they can do it is to have them do it. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Wow. How did you feel after that experience? Like I'm the man, holy cow. Like what? This is like, I knew it was real because I felt it within myself. But it's it's different. It's different to, you know, because we can drink a cup of coffee and get get a buzz. You know, we can eat something with sugar and get a buzz, but that doesn't buzz somebody else. Right. But the fact that, you know, uh, what was it Max Planck said, you know, contemporary of both Einstein and Niels Bohr, consciousness is everything. Consciousness is primary. So here I am using my consciousness, bringing her into my conscious awareness and now we're sharing this conscious awareness and through nothing more than conscious awareness she felt changes in her body mm. and so again 
it just brought me to this idea of I've been hamstringing myself when it comes to, you know, you know, intellectual or spiritual prowess because of what I thought was the creme de creme and the highest level of intellectuality was just logic. And logic was the very base level. And when we allow the noise to fall away into stillness and quiet that noise, well, then the deep wisdom will then you know, allow itself to come up and then to start to guide us uh, and show us that there's there's so much more to the world than just thinking. And that kind of started you and catapulted you um, on this journey. And I love this idea of also emotional um, pain, but I know that there is people that suffer with physical pain. And I know that you um, you hosted the, the Cancel Chronic Pain Summit, right? So this was 19 experts in the science, medical, spiritual, all those different modalities came together. What was this consensus about chronic pain, the, the cause of it and how to how to free people from it? So, you know, I, I spoke with, uh, you know, neuroscientists, you know, ACT, you know, practitioner, you know, different shamans, different, you know, remote healers and, you know, energy workers and, you know, natural paths and everyone in their own way effectively said that chronic conditions and pain come from some form of flow being blocked. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, everything's energy. Einstein said that, right. Everything's energy. And so if we look at, you know, in our, uh, in our world, our 3d world, right. The, the easiest thing to look at that's pure energy is water, right. It's nothing but oxygen and hydrogen. And if we look at water and we see if it quits flowing, well, what does it do? Well, it starts to stagnate. When what does stagnating water invite? Well, invites mosquitoes, invites bacteria, you know, different, you know, pathogens and parasites, well, when that happens, well, it, they either drain or poison, right? The lifeblood. Uh, and that then has a you know, depilitating effect on, on the body. Mm. And then we can kind of see that in a dimension up in the mind. You know, and I was, I fell victim to this for a while as well. And you can still see it to this day, right? You walk into a room full of people, especially as Americans, and you say one of three names. You don't have to say anything else other than the name. You say Donald Trump. Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton and immediately like people act like they just got possessed by an agent of the matrix. Mm -hmm. And so now they're being, um, they're being controlled by a thought virus. Mm -hmm. And why? Well, because they're, you know, they're stuck in the noise. They got nothing but this stagnant energy that's not flowing in a, in a, har a harmonious way. It's stuck with this poisonous polluted thoughts that don't do them any help. And even if either three of them are not good people, does it make the world a better place by screaming at your neighbor for thinking differently, right? Or by telling your neighbor what a terrible person they are because they they checked a different box than we did, right? Come on now, right? And, but then there's a dimension even higher that I didn't really hear anyone else talk about, but this is what I was taught. You know, and the dimension higher, well, that's the soul, right? Because so, so often, you know, you hear of, you know, like Reiki and, you know, Reiki will really help manipulate this energy here which can certainly make us feel great. Uh, what I found is that all this darkness that we involve ourselves in, whether it be the fear, the hatred, the, the, the blocking you know, of, our, of our true signal to our soul, well, what it does is it invites kind of a, you know, almost like an overcast you know, uh, energy field around us. Mm -hmm. And what that energy field does is it suppresses that signal to our higher self, much like a Faraday cage. Are you familiar with a Faraday cage? So a Faraday cage just blocks all electronic transmission. Okay. So if you're to take your phone, stick it in your microwave, close the microwave door, chances are nobody would ever be able to text that phone or call that phone because there would just be no signal, right. right? Same way like your phone right now is you know, on um, airplane mode, yep. right? That's a form of a Faraday cage that no electronic transmission can come in and none can go out. Yeah. And that's what this you know, dark energy does is that it, it suppresses Right. And this is what causes the stagnation. Right. This is what dirties that water. This is what poisons, you know, the blood as well as the uh, the, the life force. And when, you know, our soul, which is, you know, which holds our life force. Well, if that's being drained or being poisoned, well, then everything downstream is going to break down as a natural consequence. But if our soul is at full health, right, at max health and fully healed, 
well, then everything downstream is going to heal as a natural consequence. And it's really no more complicated than that. The The issue is I've, I've never heard of such a thing until I met the healing master, Ed Stracher, who taught me. And even outside of him, I've never met anyone who can actually do that. Um, and so it, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around until you actually see it. That's really beautiful to think about, you know, the, the opening, opening of the channels um, in the trauma work that we do. It's, it's a lot of like kind of reworking the neural pathways also changing, not, not what happened, but your emotions around it and your beliefs around it and the story that you told yourself around it. And you can actually see physical neural pathways opening up like a new channel of water. And eventually if the old one stops working, the old habit or the thing that was unhealthy or the old belief, that one will just eventually gray matter itself out of your brain. Cause this one is now the one that we use and you can physically see that, you know, and I just wish that the world was a little bit more up to date on the mix of how the the body, you know, mind and spirit connection really need to be realigned. They really need to be reconnected back together because they have to work together. So taking that important piece is, it's really the missing link for a lot of people. So I love that you are jumping out there as the missing link of so many, you know, people just getting back into their bodies and back into their soul. Um, you know, the brain doesn't care if we're happy. The brain's just trying to keep us alive. It doesn't yeah. care if you're content. It's not looking for peace. It doesn't care if the coping skill that it's chosen to give you might kill you early because, you know, of obesity or alcohol abuse or whatever. It just knows that in this moment, it is doing its best to keep you alive. Your soul and your spirit, those are the ones that are in charge of helping you find joy and yeah. a content life and an experience that's really worth living. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate you for all your work. We always like to um, you know, bring everything back to resources here at this podcast. So one or two, I know it sounds like your Facebook uh, meditations were life-changing for you in your personal healing journey before you have come to be your own modality, your own resource. Mm -hmm. What were some of the resources that were just really most catalyst in your healing? Uh, well, finding a mentor that you can trust mm -hmm. can, can open up you know, really everything for you. And because, you know, th the fact that, you know, my mentor, Peter Sage, you know, introduced me to Ed and then I could actually trust Ed well, then what it, it allowed me to jump in with both feet. And since I trusted him so implicitly, it allowed me to trust myself going through the process as well. And so, cause when you trust, you know, everything going around you, well, what happens is it allows the brain to quiet down because the, the, the mind is a defense mechanism. If we walk into someplace, you know, um, unfamiliar, immediately the mind's going to perceive threat. That's just how the mind works. And the mind is going to look around here. Hey, are we safe? Do we know what variables are in play? Is there something going to be here that's going to hurt me, right? What are the unknowns here? And that's going to block the signal. But since I started, you know, I, I, I found myself in this place of feeling safe, feeling comforted. Um, I actually put myself in a uh, deprivation tank, mm -hmm. right? So this is before I learned how to heal others, but I was taking myself through the, the healing. And I was like, hey, I should go to a deprivation tank. Okay, that sounds great. You know, I've heard, you know, I've heard different, uh, you know, stories. You know, again, I used to watch a bunch of Joe Rogan and, you know, he's a big fan of it. And so in this deprivation tank, I'm going through my magical meditations and I'm feeling more love, but more than love, truth. Mm -hmm. By connecting to divine truth and love. And I get this, this intuition that I should recall the grossest memory of my life. Mm -hmm. All right, game on. Let's do it. So, and... You know, since everything is a wave of light that collapses into a particle, well, then chances are we do actually live in a hologram. So just like I was in a hologram, I just, whoop, okay, here's this memory and just created it. And then I created a little boy version of me that bore witness to, to, to that memory. And, you know, my son at the time, maybe two years older than I was, and I didn't have any parents that could actually console me and make me feel safe. And to give me any sort of, of love to help me understand that, you know, none of this was my fault. So I, you know, really held a lot of, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I then projected myself as I was in that, you know, uh, deprivation tank. And I went and held that little boy's hand. Mm -hmm. And then I took this memory and it was just passing through the, not just the love, because the love helped make me feel safe, but the truth. Now as it was passing through the truth, 
it just was unhooking from the shame, yeah. from the guilt, from the anger, from the sadness. And then I was able to take that, see the truth of, of what it was that this, you know, these were two people on their own journey that had nothing to do with me. Uh, and then I passed it over onto myself. And when I gave myself that truth and that love, I then invoked the love that I have for my son. Mm. And so the love that I have for my son, right, learning how to love him will taught me how to love myself. Yeah. And so then I took all that love and as if I could just blast myself with it, like a care bear, just shooting out of my chest. Shamans use this idea of a um, soul retrieval. And almost as if a piece of our soul is captured and stuck in that point in time. And you go back and you save, save that part of your soul and you reintegrate it. And um, it's nothing I would have been able to do on my own. You know, it's something that I wouldn't have been able to do had I not been following my intuition, but I wouldn't have been able to follow my intuition to, to summon the biggest, scariest bugaboo of my life had I not actually had a mentor and somebody to help guide me on that path. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's amazing. I love that. Uh, soul retrieval is is really cool. So I'm an IFS informed coach and I do IFS for myself personally. And I, I practice it. That's internal family systems. And it's not necessarily shamanic soul retrieval, but mm -hmm. you are going back to these places where you have these little children who yeah. are scared, who are lonely. And that is the two things that we offer them is we offer them love and compassion from our adult self. And we also offer them the truth. So if like, you know, something really scary is happening, it's like, yeah, this sucks. Wow, this shouldn't have ever happened to you. I'm really sorry that this happened to you. And the, everything changes because it is this hologram that you're playing in your mind. Your mind is doing this, but that child is speaking back to you as if they are some other human outside of your body, but it's all inside of your mind. And the power that comes from that you know, some little children just collapse in your arms as soon as they know you're a, hi, I'm Sarah and I'm 40. And they're like, what? You're grown, you're grown up now. And they just, that's enough. And some of them need a lot of work to be able to let their pain go and they need to cry it out or they need to scream or whatever. And it sounds very similar to that kind of, you know, bringing up this, this negative memory. And then just kind of, I love that, that idea of just, you know, care bearing it, <laughs> just sending out this beam of, of care bear love to it. Um, because in IFS, our children tend to get very creative too. So sometimes you'll see those kind of, you know, Care Bear things or gummies or, you know, little things that came from childhood, Sesame Street characters, a lot of playground equipment, right? Because our, our brain was so young at the time. So I love this idea of, you know, going forward and just, you know, encompassing this with love, but also healing it with the truth. Yeah. Uh, this isn't your story anymore. This is not even happening anymore. We can rescue you out of this. And then in IFS, what we do after they give up their pain is we actually allow them to choose where they want to go to the beach, to the, this there, they, if they want to come in the present with us. And eventually the children just integrate into your system after a week or so you spend some time with them, but they always want to go somewhere like really creative or, you know, to the safest place that they remember or the playground that they loved or the park or outside or coloring and the creativity comes back, right? Because that's a now an unblocked piece of an avenue of flow that you can get into and uh, it brings the adventure back, you know, to life. So yeah, yeah I, I love that. Beautiful, beautiful work. Tell us more about where we can get in contact with you. Let the audience know um, how to find you, how to reach out if they're interested in working with you um, and, and doing any meditative uh, healing work with you. Yeah, I, I love that. And, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity. So if you go to freemefrompains.com, so pains is plural, uh, you'll see the option uh, where you can reach out to me, but you can even, you know, there's a, uh, you know, option to go ahead and download a free gift, right? And I've got multiple meditations there. When we're working with somebody, right, whether it's working with you, whether it's working with me, the best thing that we can do is let go of all expectations, mm -hmm. Because when we decide that healing can only occur, you know, by coming through the front door, well, if it wants to come through the chimney or if it wants to come through the window, if it wants to come through the back door, well, we're going to slam that in its face and say, well, that's not what I expected. And, you know, there's something they taught me in the army, right? Don't anticipate the command because when you anticipate the command, you look like you look foolish, right? So you wait for the world to tell you what it's go what's going on and then you respond to it because otherwise we're already digging in our defenses. And we're already saying, okay, this is the way it has to work. I'm, I'm, I'm dug in, I'm trenched in, and then we become very rigid. And the reason why rigidity blocks healing is, you know, there's a, a great verse in the Tao Te Ching 
that says, uh, when man is born, he's soft and supple. And when a plant is born, it's soft and pliable. And when man dies, he's stiff and rigid. When a plant dies, it's dry and brittle. Mm -hmm. Therefore, those who are stiff and inflexible are disciples of death. Mm -hmm. And those who are soft and supple are disciples of life. Doesn't mean you're a bad person or a good person. It just means being rigid. You know, it invites death, it invites chaos, it invites entropy, where all the rules that that hold everything together in harmony start to break apart, which is why we feel like we're dying, which is why our body goes into chronic you know, distress and get chronic conditions. But when we're soft and, and supple, we can go with the flow much more spiritual, much more, hey, you know what, give it to God, whatever that is. Hey, I can handle I can handle my life. I can't heal the world, but I can heal myself and, and then radiate out. That's such a, a better, healthier space, and it allows us to bring the best of who we are. And like I said, just really radiate that out to help whoever's in our sphere. Mm, beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Great. Great conversation today. I really appreciated having you on the show. Everything that we talked about is going to be in the show notes below for anyone listening or watching. They can go and check that out. I'll have all the links linked up for them um, and your contact information and how to get in touch with you. So thank you so much for being on the show today. And uh, have a great rest of your week. Hey, my pleasure, Sarah. Again, thank you for everything that you do. You're doing God's work here. I, I love the space that you hold and I appreciate you holding space for me today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a good one. You too. Thank you for listening to or watching this episode of the Trauma Survivorhood podcast. Please subscribe, like, share, and follow. For any information that was discussed in this podcast episode, check out the show notes below. Until next time, be well.